Okay. Good evening, everybody, to those of you in the audience and to those of you beaming, around, uh, beaming in from around the world, wherever you are. Welcome to this year's second event in our Kishore Mobabani speaker series, where we invite our whole community, uh, locally and globally, to engage with leading thinkers. And our theme this year is particularly shaped around Singapore. Under the theme of Inform, Innovate and Inspire, we seek to deepen our understanding of how we can fulfill both the needs of our mission and those of our host nation, Singapore, and contribute to the ongoing development and partnership there. Today, we're looking at the question, where shall I live, where shall I work? It's a relevant question to us all. As a parent, it's probably one we've answered already. As a student, it's certainly one that will face you shortly. We're therefore delighted to welcome Dr. Parag Khanna, celebrated author and futurist, to draw on his 2021 book, Move, where people are going for a better future today. As well as best-selling author, Parag's a leading global strategy advisor and world traveler, founder and CEO of Climate Alpha, an AI-powered analytics platform to forecast valuation, uh, values and future-proof global real estate, founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. He's uh, wearing many hats. He's also one of our parents. Move is his seventh book. As a result of all the global thinking and strategy uh, formulation that Parag's done, he was named as one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century. I don't know if we pushed off that list in years to come, Parag, but I'm sure uh, it's early to be mentioning that, but it's understandable. And he was also mentioned in Wired's smart list so plenty of, uh, plenty of thinking there and really globally recognized as a thinker. Parag's key message is that the next phase of human civilization will be characterized by both mobility and sustainability. And that the considerations that move us around the globe will be dominated by population changes, climate crisis, culture, and that as climate change moves perhaps into a genuine emergency phase, governments will destabilize and technology disrupts that will be entering a new phase of mass migration. In these cases, the future success or failure of any society, and this is a theme that's very familiar to us in Singapore, will be linked to its ability to attract skilled and mobile global citizens. What Parag has referred to as the war for young talent, sometimes the war for global talent is what we hear, but the, 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 the war for young talent in particular, is a phenomenon whereby current students and recent graduates will be the focus of countries and cities who will join organizations and corporations seeking to compete with each other for the best of the next generation. With all of this change, Parag makes a fascinating and compelling case for the emerging future map of human geography. Please welcome Parag Khanna. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Nick, for that uh, very warm and generous introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is, I think, the third time I've spoken in this uh, distinguished Kishore Mabani speaker series, and it's always a real uh, pleasure. I've now, um, I think, given more talks on this campus than I have at all of my own alma mater combined. Uh, so it's just a testament to how much I love this place. Uh, start with the slides. I'm not representing any formal uh, institution this evening. Instead. Um, can we go to the first slide, please? Um, I represent hashtag UWC Dads. Uh, so I'm here to speak to you tonight as a, uh, as a, as a, as a fellow uh, parent and uh, someone who's a great fan of this school uh, with my own children uh, having really been here since, uh, since the beginning of their education. So slightly uh, in, in a subject tonight that evolves uh, from previous books, that in fact, the ones that I've presented here, this book, Move, is really a sequel to Connectography. I wrote this book about kind of global infrastructure networks and, uh, and, and connectivity and what it means for the future of everything from geopolitics to the global economy and also migration. And what I wanted to do and what was kind of tickling or itching you know, at me since that time was to focus on not just functional geography, which is what infrastructure effectively is, but human geography. And that's what Nick was just alluding to, the future of human geography. What is the distribution of people around the world? And if you were following uh, the news 
back in November, the United Nations announced the world population has just reached or crossed 8 billion people. And the task I set for myself a few years ago when starting this book was to answer the question, if by the year 2050 or so, the world population is about 9, 9.5 billion people, where will we be? Where will the all 9, 9.5 billion people alive in the world uh, 25, 30 years from now physically be? And you have to reverse engineer the answer to that, right? And it's, there are so many causes. It could be geopolitics, and it's uh, technology, climate change, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And it became a very complex you know, set of rabbit holes that I went down. And the result, after I pieced all of the various threads and trends together, uh, was this. And in a way, I realized that the future, to almost to, to come to the, to the punchline up front, is a moving target. I thought that I could paint a linear picture. People from place X will move to place Y. People from place A will move to place B. And I actually came to the conclusion uh, that we'll really be more nomadic again. And nomadism um, is really innate, actually, to the human condition. To move is human, as I say. Um, so it's, we will be more migratory than we are accustomed to having been in recent centuries. But it's not out of the ordinary in the grand scheme of things. So that's my initial point of uh, departure. But um, as Nick said, the theme of the series overall for this uh, term, for this year, is around cities, hubs, future of work, uh, migration, travel, and so forth. And that's actually a really great choice of theme because, of course, of this post-COVID moment where people are on the move again. But I want to bring us all back. Can we go to the next slide or the first slide? Yeah. If you can read that, I'll come back to in a second. If you can remember back to about uh, two and a half years ago, say, um, no, wait, exactly three years ago, right? Uh, beginning of COVID, um, you know, March, February, March 2020, when headlines around the world all carried the same phrase, great lockdown, right? And we were told fairly conclusively and confidently that this was the end of migration, the end of travel, we'd all be locked down, it's the end of globalization, it's the end of pretty much everything for some indeterminate, uh, indefinite period of time. And that was a really bitter moment because we simultaneously got the data from 2019 around global migration and travel. And 2019 was the absolute record year in all of human history for number, the number of people crossing borders. It had been 1.5 billion people crossed borders that were measured in the year 2019. And at, the, at that point in time, also 275 million people were living outside of their country of origin, both absolute records. And then it all came to a grinding halt. And so this first slide is actually for the parents, because I'm sure in those early months of COVID, we were all having similar conversations. When you could get together at a dinner table for two, sometimes four, sometimes six, usually just two or four, as you recall, the rules around how many people could, could coalesce. But the topic of conversation that I noticed, and this was even like Zoom double dates with people on the other side of the world. And then finally, when traveling again, incrementally, as people got together, I sensed more and more lunches, dinner parties. The same question kept on getting asked, and that's what they're saying here. What's your plan B? Does anyone can, I hope that, can, that resonates vaguely with some of you from, from not only 2020, but now really 2021, 2022, subsequently. People are always asking now, what would you do if? If another pandemic hits, you know, if you have conflict here, what's really the optimal place to be? We all appreciate place more now that we were stuck in place uh, suddenly against our will. And some people were in places where, obviously, where COVID was, was better managed than others. Uh, some people were in places where the second borders opened, they couldn't wait to escape and get out. But the common theme on everyone's mind was, where would I go if? What is my plan B? And I sense now, in, the wor in a world of such immense uncertainty and complexity, everyone kind of now has in their mind, what if I weren't here? Where would I ideally be? And do I want to go to that place now or later? And now in a world where remote work and Zooming is possible, um, you know, what's the ideal place uh, to be for all of those things? Uh, next slide, please. So as I say, that was just the COVID 
addendum almost. I'd actually finished the book before COVID, but I was given an extra year to revise it because I couldn't go and, and travel and, and, uh, and promote it and so forth. So I took that time to think about how, okay, the headlines are telling us in March of 2020 that we're never going to travel again, we're never going to move again. But the reality of the drivers of what causes people to move are incredibly deep and entrenched and, um, and, and evolving, really, over a much larger period of time than just one particular co you know, sort of pandemic moment as, as, uh, as, as weighty as that was at the time. And I thought about, well, what are the fundamental drivers of human mobility? Going back, let's say, 100,000 years, just to be comprehensive and make sure I don't miss anything, right? And when you think about it, uh, in, in, in not no particular order, but these would be the most important. Actually, if you go back, say, 12,000 years to so the retreat of the last ice age, that enabled human mobility. So climate was a factor in the past, less so in recent centuries, but of course becoming one again. Demographic imbalances, right? Particularly in the 20th century, where you had labor shortages emerge in Europe and the United States, you had significant migration from countries with younger populations uh, to those that were aging. We have that, of course, again now. Political upheaval, geopolitics. Think about everything from World War II to today's uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and, uh, and refugee crises. Uh, economic dislocation and technological disrup disruption, those go hand in hand in many ways. Uh, think about how when, when uh, outsourcing of labor has taken place, jobs, you know, factories are shuttered, jobs are lost, people have to move. Uh, and now again, there's a positive story with, with technology when it comes to um, remote work. Right now you can move and still be connected and, and be anywhere. So all of these things together, you know, past, present, and future, they, they all, all of the drivers of migration generally fit into one of these five buckets. And I thought about it sort of, COVID 2020, 2021, you stand still. But these five things are all in hyperdrive. Demographic imbalances, the gap between old and young within and across them has never, ever, ever been as extreme as it is today. It is so incredibly lopsided, as we all know from all Western countries, our aging societies with massive labor shortages that can only be filled through immigration. Geopolitical upheaval. Right now, there's at least seven major conflict zones around the world, geopolitical fault lines, civil wars, from which at least one million people have been displaced. Think of Myanmar, think of Yemen, think of Syria, think of Ukraine, uh, think of Afghanistan, Venezuela. Uncorrelated, unrelated to each other on every continent, you have mass political displacement underway right now in real time, right? And then, of course, the technological disruption, enough said, you know, again, the positive and the negative, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the disruption of uh, manufacturing, the manufacturing base through globalization and outsourcing, and new industrial manufacturing hubs being created and those attracting workers. Think about you know, the, the migration of people from rural to urban China and that same effect that's happening um, uh, all over the world in emerging markets right now. And then climate change, as if climate change suddenly stopped because of COVID, because of course it didn't, right? So to my mind, despite the, the headwinds to human mobility, the fundamental drivers are as strong as ever and they will manifest themselves. And, and here we are and we see the evidence in such a short amount of time, just three years after we were told we're never gonna travel again, the numbers have eclipsed those 2019 numbers, right? You can't get a flight anywhere, and it costs three times more. Uh, you know, the number of people who, again, who are migrating and relocating is, again, at record levels and so forth. So mobility always prevails. And the little simple formula that I devised is that you take these fundamental drivers, multiply it by the ever-expanding connectivity that I mentioned before as kind of the prequel thesis to this, and you get accelerated mobility. And I, I really believe it will accelerate from here. And historical, the historical arc is very, very clear. We have gone from centuries past, say take the 16th century onwards, to from centuries where only hundreds of thousands of people migrated transcontinentally to millions, to tens of millions. In the 19th and 20th centuries, it became hundreds of millions. And in this young century already, and, and certainly as this century moves on, we will easily cross a billion people that will migrate for one of these regions. The decimal point is always shifting to the right. 
This is an absolute irrefutable historical fact. Even amidst all the uncertainty, complexity, and things that may stop us from moving, everything, all evidence suggests we will have more, more, more. And of course, we're not really prepared for it. We don't even have the intellectual frameworks uh, for, the, for the degree of mobility that lies ahead um, and, and confronting or addressing the drivers, whether we wanted to stop it or whether we wanted to shape it. Uh, and that's, those are the themes that I think are extremely important in an almost existential way uh, to address. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So how will this all play out? Uh, the answer is not, very, in, not in a very neat and tidy fashion. Um, so I kind of built the argument around four scenarios. And in scenario planning as a methodology, as an exercise, you want to build plausible stories or narratives that are not mutually exclusive um, and that are not unrealistic and that partially overlap because that gives more of a realistic texture, right? Um, and th that's the nature of the four scenarios that I created here to capture what might happen in the future. And part of doing a good, making a good scenario is that the seeds of that scenario are present in reality today, in the present, because otherwise it would be purely fictitious. So if you look around the world, you can see that along these axes that I've created here of more or less migration versus more or less sustainability, you have four scenarios playing out. One of them I call regional fortresses, a world in which um, the continental zones, like North America, Europe, North, e North Asia, really try to wall themselves off from inward migration and focus on their own sustainability, decarbonizing their economies, adapting to climate change, and so forth. Then you have these two lower scenarios, the new Middle Ages and barbarians at the gate, where you have mass uncontrolled migration, resource wars, uh, water wars, you know, uh, conflicts over, over scarcity, um, and, uh, and societies really unable to manage their sustainability well, nor manage immigration well. And then you have in the upper right what I call northern lights, in which we realize that this is all coming, we know it's inevitable, and we plan ahead. We pre-design, as I call it, we pre-design our habitats to, be, uh, to accommodate mobility, but also to be sustainable at the same time, to avoid the tragedy of the commons, to avoid trampling on pristine geographies that are livable, livable that are habitable, uh, but instead use the technologies at our disposal today to start to think in a premeditated way about where people should live and will live in light of uh, climate change in particular, uh, forcing mass migrations. So I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to happily land in that upper right quadrant. We're not. And all around the world, though, you see evidence of all of these scenarios happening at the same time. You could be a hyper-pessimist and say, look at the, um, the, the climate crises and the political unrest and state failure in Central America and the waves of uh, Latin American migrants that are making their way across the Mexican border into the United States. Look at the African populations trying to cross the Mediterranean in rafts and the way in which they're being uh, battled back by European uh, border control forces and so on and so on. Or you could say, well, look at Canada, right? Canada, uh, you know, let's send 500,000 people every single year. It's by far the most generous country in terms of net inward migration as a percentage of its own population with, with very little political backlash against it. Both are true at the same time, right? So these scenarios, again, they overlap. They're all happening simultaneously, and they will continue to. Even in a perfect world where we do lots of that, we'll also probably have lots of this. Right? Because the world is indeed a, a patchwork uh, of geographies with no one common governance system or, or set of norms that genuinely and forcibly imposes itself and conditions uh, our behavior, especially when it comes to migration. And you're writing about migration, the one thing you have to remember is that it is the last thing that will ever, ever, and I do mean ever, be centrally regulated in global governance. Because if you think about it, it, it so confronts the idea of sovereignty. Our international order, our system of sovereign nations, of nation states is premised on the idea of sovereignty. And sovereignty has been eroded in so many ways, right? You have, it's difficult to control your currency and interest rates. Uh, you can't control your, um, the flow of pathogens and pandemics and all of these other things that have, again, weakened sovereignty. So when all 
um, when all of the uh, kind of uh, trappings of sovereignty have been almost taken away from governments, there's, there's ultimately just one thing left, which is just controlling your borders against the movement of people. Right? That's the one thing left of sovereignty. And that's the one thing no government is ever, ever going to give up. And you notice that even in the Schengen area uh, of, of your, the European Union, uh, during COVID, there were moves to close borders and restrict that movement. Uh, so when push comes to shove, sovereignty pre prevails. You know, and the governments will probably co cooperate on all sorts of uh, interplanetary kinds of things. You know, we'll have common, common cause to establish a moon colony. We'll still never agree on open borders and migration. So I think that's really important to be really realistic about uh, the future that lies ahead. Instead, you're gonna have a, a really very different set of trends play out in different regions of the world, and they'll be colored by these four scenarios and themes. If we can go to the next slide, please. So if people are gonna be moving more and more, driven by technology, by geopolitics, by climate change, um, who's gonna be doing the moving? And I said at the beginning that the world population is, is peaking more rapidly than people had thought 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were forecasts that still that the world population could reach 13 or 14 billion people. Well, every two or three years, the demographic experts revise that projection downward. And now, I don't want to say the upper limit, but a rough consensus is somewhere between 10 and 11 billion people will be what I call peak humanity. I think even that is way off. I literally do not think the world population will cross 10 billion people. Uh, fertility has been collapsing all over the world since the 1970s, even in uh, developing societies. We have had two major baby busts uh, in just the last 15 years, the financial crisis of 2008, and COVID, of course, uh, which was even more severe, far more severe than the financial crisis. What's more important is that they happen so close in time to each other that you've had a genuine, um, again, downward disruption uh, in, the, in the fertility rate, even beyond what we had prior to the financial crisis and COVID. And that is going to... Uh, sort of bend the curve even more rapidly. So in terms of population scenarios, I think that we're headed more towards the rapid population decline scenario. The peak humanity moment is coming before the year 2040, um, and we'll start to taper off uh, from there and, and, and move downward relatively quickly as the baby boomer generation expires and, and, and so forth. So we're looking at a population uh, that will probably not reach 10 billion people. And the question becomes, you know, uh, it becomes academic at this point to debate how low will it go, right? And, and simply by what time frame? Because I think that the, uh, the, the catastrophic scenarios are certainly out there uh, around climate change and, and so forth, and that could lead to, uh, to a more rapid decline. Or there are scenarios, again, where we restabilize uh, uh, the commons and their and that incentives uh, for, for higher fertility or stabilizing fertility are restored. We don't really know. We can only speculate at this point in time. But I'll tell you what's baked in. What's baked in is that, um, and this is maybe an appropriate place to talk about this, but our children aren't having children. Right? This is directed at uh, parents out there. And that's what this next slide, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is not a matter for debate. Uh, and by the way, I urge everyone to watch a new documentary that's just come out called, uh, I think it's called The Birth Gap. It's free online. Uh, 40, 15 minute documentary that explains uh, this um, collapse in fertility that began in the 1970s and does so in a very, very rigorous fashion covering many uh, societies around the world. So what are you looking at here? Well, for the past century, every generation was larger than the one before it. Right? the greatest generation, uh, baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, right? Roughly incrementally rising in size from 1.6 uh, billion people total were the baby boomers up to roughly uh, 1.9 billion people, which is Gen Z. So Gen Z, many children at UWC are, are Gen Z kids, are the, is the largest generational cohort that the human species has ever produced, 1.9 billion people. But if you look at for the fertility rate of millennials, right, and older Gen Z, it's fallen off a cliff, right? Even young Gen X have far fewer children than, uh, than earlier generations. So that's where you look to see how many fewer children are gonna be born in the future. Now the final curve here in which I offer a baseline scenario and the dashed line is for Gen Alpha. 
Gen alpha are today's toddlers and babies, and it's, they're still not complete. Only in 2025 will we know how many Gen alpha children there are in the world. Now, owing to these last two baby busts of the financial crisis and uh, COVID, um, it's fairly certain now that Gen Alpha will literally be smaller than Gen Z. So Gen Z, you know, power to the UWC uh, generation today, you're the largest group of human beings, demographic cohort that has ever existed and will ever exist. Uh, it goes downhill from there. Now, they're still very large, right? Whether it's 1.9 billion people or 1.8 billion people, it's still a lot of people. So the world is still more young than old, which is why I focus on young people as a subject uh, you know, uh, of, of this book in particular, because they're the ones who do the moving. Older people are more sedentary. Younger people are the ones who are more likely to be uh, mobile. And so we have these three, if you take the latter three curves, millennials, Gen Z, or millennials, um, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha will be the three largest generations ever. They will comprise about five and a half to six billion people in total. They will be a ever larger share of the world population because elderly people will pass on, but they are having fewer kids. So therefore, today's young people are the present mass of humanity, but they're also the future uh, mass of humanity. Because if they're not having kids, it means they are the present and the future. And this is a kind of a sci-fi-ish statement that I want to, want to clarify so that everyone understands. What we're living through right now has never, ever happened before. There's no precedent for this. There's no guidance for this. There's no playbook for this that any government has. Uh, we've never experienced, and certainly not in the last 100 years, when the world population increased from 2 billion people to 8 billion people. No one alive today, not yourselves, not your parents, not your grandparents, you've never had a conversation. You've never had direct or indirect experience of the world in which the population was not going like this, right? And that's exactly what's happening now is suddenly it's going like this. And I don't think that we have even begun to grasp uh, the implications of that. Um, and, and the corollary to that is, and again, the reason it's happening is because when our kids don't have kids, they dominate the present, but they also dominate the future because fewer come after them. And therefore, where they go today, physically, where they physically go, where they physically live, pretty much determines which societies will have people at all, which is, again, a radical departure from hundreds, if not thousands of years, because for thousands of years, any time a society loses people, it just keeps on producing more people because families were having six, seven, eight, nine, 15 children, right? It's not happening anymore. So the present is the future, and young people determine the winning and losing societies of the uh, 21st century. Um, as they vote with their feet. So that's how all of these themes tie together. And for all of the complexity in the world, I boil down my thesis to the following, which is the winning societies of the 21st century are those that are attracting young people. And the societies that are shedding young people are the losers of the future. There may even be vacant states. It's a term that I use in the book, and I had to kind of dig into international legal scholarship to see if there's any literature on this. What happens if a country, if a state, fails to meet the definition of statehood, which is that you have a permanent resident population and recognize borders? You're no longer really even a state. And there are places that are depopulating so quickly because of climate crisis and state failure and collapse that they're not even really going to be countries anymore. That's some, just example of what lies ahead. But let's focus on the global war for young talent and cities because that's really the, the main theme, but I needed to set it all up by focusing on young people and, and mobility. So let's go to the next slide. So now we have to look at the, click one more time, please. There we go. So now let's get into the human geography part again. Fundamentally, this was an exercise in, in, in exploring the future of human geography, which again is a fancy way of saying, where are the people and where will the people be? Well, where the people are is here in Asia. Right? Asia represents the majority of the human population, and it probably always will, uh, for reasons that are best viewed in the next slide, please. Um, right. So now, if the world is still more young than old, and there are five and a half billion young people, and most of the world's young people are in Asia, most of the world's young people globally are young Asians. Correct? Follow me? So therefore, it follows that if you had to describe the future of the human species in exactly two words, the two words that I would choose would be Asian youth. 
I think that's literally a true statement. The future of the human species is primarily Asian youth because there's way more young people in Asia than there are in the rest of the world. And here what you see is only the working age millennial population of Asia, the big bar on the right in yellow, versus every other part of the world, right? And, uh, the, and as you can clearly see, this is just working age millennials. But remember, Gen Z and Gen Alpha are going to be even larger than millennials. There are even more young Asians coming after today's millennials. And in other parts of the world, fertility has declined. Only Africa it also has high fertility, but only has a billion people, whereas Asia has five billion people. So no matter how many children uh, they still may have in Africa, it doesn't hold a candle to the number of people in Asia. So again, logically speaking, the future of the human species is Asian youth. And youth are mobile because they don't have children and don't own homes. So where are they going to go is, again, the answer to the winning and losing societies of the 21st century. So the global war for young talent is also a global war for young Asian talent, you might say. So that brings us to uh, the next uh, argument, which is, uh, next slide, please. Let's get inside the heads of kids. Uh, next slide, please. Right. Uh, oh, sorry, let's go one more. Uh, one more, one more, uh, forward, forward, do, do, do. one more, one more, okay. Um, here, this is the kind of psychological exercise. I said, well, what we old people think, right, doesn't really shape uh, the future as much as what today's young people think. What are their values? What are their attitudes? Well, fortunately, today's um, Gen Z in particular is the most surveyed and psychoanalyzed generation in human history because we have all of their Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, you know, metadata, right? And we've got surveys taken by research organizations and media uh, all over the world. So for the first time in history, we do have a, a broad, a global sense of what, if any, generational consciousness actually exists. And this is a big rupture from the past because in the past you would say that Older people share and pass on values to the next generation, right? And so you have a vertical transmission of identity, right? Ethnic identity, religious identity, other kinds of values. Well, today, what we find from the, the surveys that have been done is that young people have more in common with each other in terms of their values than they do with their parents or their grandparents. And if it can be summed up in, you know, sort of three words, three of the terms that come up most in terms of what young people subscribe to as their values, what they consider to be virtuous, are connectivity, sustainability, and mobility, right? Almost as if these are the cardinal human rights. And again, everyone may have their own opinion, but this is, this is metadata, right? This is, this is massive global survey sample from all countries. So you can have young Nigerians and Brazilians and Americans and Russians and Chinese and Germans. You know, this is really all over the world you're seeing this generational a sense of alignment towards these uh, attitudes. So you have horizontal identity rather than vertical identity, which is something that's quite new. You have a pretty clear articulation of what those values are, which I think is very revealing and uh, certainly consistent with everything I've seen in uh, my own household and uh, in this city and in this school. And you can probably relate to some of this. And again, underpinned by the changing socio-demographic and economic structure and, and, and conditions of this generation. Like I said, if you wanted to ask, what does the average person in the world sort of think? And you know, we, we all speak in the first person plural all the time. You know, we believe this and people, or even in the third person, well, people think this, right? We, we are just in this habit and people project their values onto their nation and their national values onto the world in some universalist kind of way. But I kind of said, I, the question I asked was, if you were to take the median human being in the world, line up the 8 billion people in the world and pick person 4 billion, who is that person? Is that person really someone who is um, middle-aged, middle class, upper middle class, living in a Western society, in the suburbs, a two-parent, two-child, two-income household, um, you know, owning a home with a mortgage and having stable employment? Well, many of us may have grown up that way. Uh, that's sort of how I grew up in New York. But that's not that median human being in the year 2023, right? The median human being, that four billionth person in the year 2023, is almost in every way the inversion of that, right? It is someone who is young, not old, someone who has no children, 
who is financially struggling, does not own a home, uh, uh, lives in a small uh, you know, apartment, in a tenement of some kind, and is certainly not in an OECD country, but is in a uh, mega city in the developing world. That's the four billionth person, right? And that's literally, that, that is, when you say we are the world, right? Who is the world? Well, I can say that those are literally the precise characteristics of the largest number of human beings in the world. Not that the largest number of human beings in the world is Christian or Muslim or whatever the case may be. No, this, these conditions is the most accurate statement of what describes uh, the largest mass of human beings in the world. That, that is it. And if you want to understand what they're going to do in the future, what their choices are, what, what, they're, what is motivating them, you have to understand those initial conditions. And these are the material initial conditions of today's youth. And again, they're the ones most likely to be voting with their feet and shaping the societies that are the winners and losers of the future. So what are they looking for? Well, I call it latitude, uh, uh, attitude, and altitude. Right? So climate is a motivator, so they're looking for the right uh, you know, uh, altitude, almost, uh, you could say, or latitude and, and, and altitude or, or proxies for that. But attitude matters, right? What are the kinds of societies and places, and primarily cities, right, that are attracting young people? Because young people have grown up in a world that, that are, that's rapidly urbanizing. Um, cities are places that are very welcoming. Uh, tend to be more welcoming towards migrants, that tend to be more liberal, uh, that align in many ways with, the, with these virtues. So the question is which cities are doing the best job of attracting uh, today's uh, migratory uh, youth. Um, so what I want to do in the final few slides is kind of break down global demographics uh, or, or migration into segments of professional, either by age or by profession, um, uh, or, or cohort in order to look at some of the trends and which places are the winners and the losers. So if we can jump ahead a couple of slides. Let's go one. Go ahead, one. Um, right. So let's start at you know, what you might call the, the, the top of the, the funnel. And uh, you know, this is here in Singapore. We're in the midst of uh, a kind of influx of high net worth individuals that are coming from, uh, from mainland China, from Hong Kong, from other Asian countries, uh, from, from Western countries, and so forth. And there's a, really an a arbitrage game, a competition underway uh, to attract people who are investor migrants, uh, as they're known, whether it's through investor residency or citizenship programs. And, um, and some of the winners in, in that hunt uh, are not only um, Singapore, but also Canada, Portugal, Greece, the United Arab Emirates, countries that are offering these so-called uh, nomad visas. Then there are places, again, that are uh, the largest um, origin countries for outbound high net worth individuals who are taking their money, their capital, their talent, their resources, the jobs they create, their businesses, and so forth, away uh, from, their, from their homelands. And those are certainly places like Russia, China, uh, Brazil, and India, for example. Uh, India as you would have guessed actually from the previous slide where you saw the, the, um, the share of the global and Asian population, now that India is the largest country in the world by population, also one of the youngest countries in terms of median age, certainly far younger than China is, it's also the largest origin country for outbound migration in the world by, by far. In fact, it's so interesting, if you look at UN data in five-year increments and look at the number of people who, who leave any given uh, country, uh, India is number one, sort of up here. It's about, I think, 500,000 people who leave India every single year on average. And then there's country number two. You have to kind of insert a line break or several line breaks, and you get down to country number two. Can anyone guess what country number two is? It's Poland. Now, I, you don't need to know the exact population of Poland, but I'm sure you know that's a lot less than the population of India, right? A lot, lot less. So, India, by virtue of the demographics, um, you know, is, is likely to be the origin country for the largest number of outbound migrants pretty much for the entire rest of our lives. Right? It's almost hard to imagine any country ever coming even remotely close. And so I have a whole section of the book, uh, uh, I think cheekily titled The Future is Brown. Or I think it's called The Future is Brown-ish. Um, because that's literally what's happening as you see South Asians generally Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, which remember that subregion is 1.8 billion people. So by far the most populous region of the world, climate stressed, uh, you know, politically uh, you know, questionably governed, uh, high propensity for outbound migration with some of the skill sets 
um, you know, basic competence in English, but also people educated in either IT or nursing that are in high demand around the world. So the stars are aligning both on the supply and the demand side for South Asian populations to pretty much you know, flood uh, the world. And some of them, some segment of it, is also ultra high net worth or high net worth migrants. Uh, let's go to the next slide. One of the things I, I look at, and you can't read the specifics here, but is, is looking at um, uh, survey data and policy data around the preferences of professional migrants. Now, it doesn't matter if it's high net worth or just skilled migrants uh, in, any, in any profession uh, aggregated together. And what you see as a common theme is that um, you know, highly educated people prefer to move to Anglophone countries uh, or to Europe. Uh, Canada is really outperforming. I mentioned earlier just numerically Canada is a huge destination for migrants, uh, but also a desired destination for professionals. Um, and uh, the UAE emerging as a global hub. Uh, the UAE last year, according to uh, Henley advisors, uh, brought in um, more millionaires in, ab in an absolute number than any country uh, in the world uh, in a single year. Um, and Asian countries are gaining ground in terms of being a destination. Again, a country like Singapore has always been thought of as an expat hub, but now Japan is as well. And, uh, and, and you know, non-citizens um, of places like even uh, you know, Malaysia and, and Japan, again, are attracting more and more permanent foreign migrants uh, to their shores. And that's really helping to reinforce uh, their economies. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned here, survey data we have, I, there might be 2022, but not, not yet. But, but in 2020, um, you could see some of the shifts, countries like Canada and Australia really rising up in terms of their attractiveness to skilled migrants. This is a survey of 300,000 uh, professionals from around the world. Um, so Canada for the first time coming in first place. Um, again, Japan rising up steadily. Uh, Singapore, as you see, and New Zealand appearing for the first time uh, on this table. So countries that you do know are very livable places, very desirable places, but also more of them being Asian countries at the same time. Next slide, please. And now I want to focus on young people again, right? So in a world where people have graduated high school, graduated college, and get to, again, vote with their feet, decide where they want to be, where the world is their oyster, because 100 countries have these digital nomad programs and are trying to attract and lure um, young professionals inside their borders. Remember, during COVID, countries realized that they're, they've been starved of the circulation of people. Right, the, the tourists, the business travelers, the conference goers, um, who were su such a critical or such a crucial lifeblood for any services economy, that just dried up, and so countries realized that rather than want to be, you know, want to lock themselves down forever, they want to open up as quickly as possible. So prior to COVID, only one or two countries had nomad visa programs, like Estonia, for example. Right today, about a hundred countries do. So we went from being told, again, great lockdown, you're stuck in place forever, to instead 100 countries saying, please, 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 young people, come and stay in my country, get your visa on arrival, stay as long as you like, stay in an Airbnb, just come. Right? That, that's, that's the reality. So whenever people tell me that you know, populism, nationalism, xenophobia, borders, protectionism, that those are the defining megatrends of the world, like really? Now, how come 100 countries today have nomad visa programs, whereas two countries did two years ago? Because no one, no United Nations edict said that 100 countries need to have nomad visa programs, right? Every country realized on their own that they need people and that they want people. And this will be the defining legacy, I think, of, uh, of, of COVID and the labor shortages. So what motivates young people? Well, again, we have data for this, right? If you had to boil down uh, you know, again, I mentioned earlier three cardinal virtues, sustainability, connectivity, mobility, yes. But what do people want in a destination? It turns out young people want two things, affordable rent and fast internet, right? So it all translates, all comes down to those two things. The food doesn't have to even be great, right? Just has, rent has to be affordable and internet has to be fast. So you can simply correlate these things and look at, at, uh, at data around. And this is on the left, the right side, a table is broken down by city. So Buenos Aires has uh, low internet speed but low, low rent. 
uh, you know, you're looking for the kind of happy medium. And you'll see places pop up like Lisbon, for example, fast internet, still affordable rent, Berlin, which is attracting tons of young people. And all of the cities that I've been traveling to in, in my research for this book are definitely places where I've noticed young people are just organically showing up. You know, and the lingua franca of these places is becoming English, basically, uh, as the common uh, denominator. And then, in particular, on the left, are places that are the top choices for software uh, developers. So what, what I glean from this is there's never been a better time to be young and skilled, right? Um, I put myself through the uh, Canadian immigration online portal just as a, as a research exercise uh, to see how I would come out in their points-based system. And by virtue of being over 40, uh, I got two points. And it didn't, never mind if you have a PhD, they couldn't care less. <laughs> but if you are a 20-year-old Brazilian, you have like 24 points, right? So again, never been a better time to be a young uh, person with some skill. And, and even today in the UK, you know, in the past, even just five, 10 years ago, before, during, and after Brexit, um, you know, you'd have to pay a security bond and show proof of um, employment before you could enter the country. Today, the UK has relaxed all of those measures, right? Just, you know, did you graduate from a university we've heard of? Yes, okay, show up, just come, right? So, you know, it, it raises a lot of questions about what the purpose of Brexit was all about. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. But anyway, every country has realized they want young migrants. And so young migrants are looking for these things. Um, Let's uh, jump ahead a couple of slides, and I want to wrap up by talking about um, one, let's go one or two slides ahead. One more? Right, students, right? Um, so for all the young UWC kids out there who are deciding where they want to go to college, I think this is really, really interesting uh, time because the, the war for talent you know, begins with your generation, right, with the student generation. It's which countries are attracting um, the university students, the college students, the exchange students, and giving them a fast track uh, to, towards permanent residency or citizenship to retain them to stay in the country rather than simply bounce around like mercenaries. And that's, that's really where you're seeing really creative and, uh, and constructive shifts in policy. So the United States is you know, the incumbent in terms of uh, largest number of overseas students arriving every year, but countries like Canada are gaining ground rapidly. In fact, this number I was told yesterday evening is no longer 645,000, it's now 800,000. And remember, on a per capita basis, right, Canada has one-tenth the population of the United States and has about uh, you know, one, more than one-half the number of foreign students. Right? And they're pulling out all the stops. It's a $25 billion industry for Canada is just foreign students. And the number is growing and growing and growing. European countries, as I mentioned earlier, have uh, you know, you know, re shifted their education models. And you're seeing English uh, becoming the, um, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the basic language for, for undergraduate education on a lot of campuses in non-English speaking countries. And here in Asia, in Asian countries, China, Japan, um, to say nothing, obviously, of Australia, for which education is a huge uh, export service, um, there's significant effort to attract and retrain, retain uh, students from within Asia. Again, think about where, what are the origin countries? Asia. Where are Asian students accustomed to going? Abroad. Which countries want to retain them to fuel their innovation economies and their diversification? Asians do. So the whole world, every country, is trying its best to retool its educational systems, uh, shifting to English, focusing on technical skills, uh, attracting talent in academia in order to attract the young people, and then changing the visa policies to get them to stay and to contribute to those economies. And that is, in a very technical way, behind the scenes, uh, how the global war for young talent uh, is playing out. Um, uh, all over the world. And you can see it not so much through the bad news that we hear every day, right? But rather through some of these good news kinds of changes as countries realize that there's really only two kinds of countries in the world. Those that realize that, they, that there is this global war for young talent and they need to vigorously compete in it and change their norms, their governance, their economic models, everything to attract those young people. And then the other set of countries which haven't realized that they're in that war, and they're gonna lose that war. And I think that you know, cities, you know, global hubs, places like Singapore, uh, have 
clearly woken up to that and are competing more and more. And there's other cities around the world that, uh, that are doing that. And, and cities act in many ways often against what their perceived or what the national interest is. You can go back to Brexit, right, where you know, the national population by a sliver voted for Brexit, but major cities, populous cities like London didn't, right? So I think of cities very much as the kind of beacons uh, that are going to be attractive to young people. So I don't know which countries necessarily will win the war for young talent, but you can certainly know which cities are going to win based upon going there, traveling there, and seeing these trends play out uh, on the ground. So. With that, uh, let me stop. And uh, thank you again for uh, having me here. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prague. There's so much to think about there. So I'll just take a moment while everybody can take a breath and gather the questions. Um, you st and I will pass to you to sort of just take questions from the audience in a moment, and Sinead will take questions uh, from our online people. So anybody watching from online, please do uh, type in your questions, and we'll be able to, to put them uh, in a moment. But perhaps I can start off with just one sort of personal thing there, because I still need to process everything I've heard. But you mentioned Plan B at the start there, uh, and you were here at the start of the pandemic, so I know you were thinking about that too. Uh, for you personally, having traveled to so many places, if it all went differently for you and plan A didn't work out for you and your family, where would, where would plan B take you, Prague? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. We did have that moment because you know, we're accustomed to definitely being very much at home in Singapore, but also having Singapore as this very connected hub. And you know, we treat Changi Airport, as all of you do as well, I, I suppose, as like sort of a bus stop. You know, it's just so easy to come in and out. And it was definitely a period of uncertainty and, and you know just really a shock to the system obviously as it was for everyone say when will I ever get to travel again and, and uh, like many of you at least in my case I really depend on it um, and so it was strange we thought well well you know is Singapore really going to be much more strict than other places and what are places that are more uh, open and, and you know equally connected so we definitely were exploring uh, you know Dubai came up on the list uh, you know going to uh, California came up as an option, and we weighed those options pretty seriously. Not that it would have been a permanent move, but it was where do you preserve your ability to be mobile at a time of a lockdown, right? And again, the policies, as you will remember, from 2020, 2021 were very differential, right? So it was kind of an arbitrage game that we were playing in our heads. And ultimately, I'm very glad, obviously, that we just stayed here. And it was a delightful year and a half of not, <laughs> not traveling. And it led to, you know, I think lifestyle changes that I hope uh, all of you also enjoyed and, and benefited from. Uh, but, uh, but Singapore ultimately did play it right, you know, by, uh, I think, by having a strong, positive, you know, performance during COVID and when borders open, people voted for quality, right? There's been a flight to quality, and Singapore represents quality. So rather than having to leave here, we now have a lot more neighbors, as I'm sure you've noticed. Should we take an online question? Or someone in the audience? Right of first, uh, students first. Uh, at the start, you were talking a little bit about states that uh, might not really be states anymore because people left. Were there? Any specific regions where you think that would happen a lot or any more info? Well, these are the kinds of things that happen, you know, just one by one in a, in a very, you know, sort of fragmented uh, way. But I've looked at, uh, you know, countries potentially in sub-Saharan Africa, given the climate profile, or the Horn of Africa as well, a country like Eritrea, uh, uh, Arabian, an Arabian Gulf country like Yemen, uh, for example, which is completely running out of water, right, and is racked by, by civil war. So any number of places may effectively lose, you know, a, there are already places that are, I don't want to say past the point of no return, but when all of your young people start to migrate away, you may still have people, but the likelihood of domestic or foreign investment in that country diminishes with, you know, in, uh, in, in um, or the foreign investment uh, uh, decreases, you know, almost proportionate to the population uh, outflow, right? So, you know, and, and remittances do as well. So there was a time, again, when populations are growing and people still feel connected to their to country they came from and they work very hard abroad and send those remittances back and they want to build hospitals and schools. But as they see the population just declining and declining, they say, well, what's the point of giving money back for anything systemic, for anything institutional? Uh, you know, when in fact their number one objective is to just bring relatives with them 
uh, to migrate. And so that also has this negative knock-on effect. And you're starting to see that happen in quite a few countries that have been uh, previously dependent on remittance flows. And when remittances and investment dry up and governments are still you know, poor and underperforming and, and quite frankly failing, and you have a climate crisis, uh, and you have a COVID pandemic, and you have a, a, you know, a, a sort of um, a massive uh, debt load on a country, that's a really bad scene. You know, and right now there are dozens and dozens of countries that are in that predicament. Uh, so, you know, uh, again, it's not just climate change. It's all of these factors together that are sorting out the quote unquote winners and losers. And again, in, in, certainly in your lifetime, there will be countries that just won't have really people anymore. Um, or they won't have the native population. This is something I get into a little bit in the book. Remember that this is not just places that we think of as, you know, places that have traditionally been uh, heavily indebted poor countries. Um, or, or, um, or underdeveloped countries. But you, the, the depopulation effect is happening in large countries too. You know, Japan is rapidly uh, you know, losing its population, but it still has well over 100 million people. You know, Russia is rapidly depopulating, but still has over 100 million people. Eastern European countries are incredibly small, right? And they're also losing people. A country like, uh, you know, say, Bulgaria, for example, only has, what, five, six million people and also loses a lot of its uh, talent as well. Um, so this is a worldwide phenomenon, actually. Again, Central American countries, too, where everyone really pretty much wants to leave and move north. So this is, this is happening everywhere. Uh, maybe I can just ask a question, sure. Parag, from coming in from online. There are actually quite a few questions asking about the competition versus collaboration, and there are two that I'd like to ask you directly, mm -hmm. if I may. The first is from Corrado, who's actually one of our alumni, who's uh, tuned in. And his question is really, could you build your scenarios also on the basis of a collaborative approach rather than a competitive one, as per your statement on the competition for young intellects? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. And there are perhaps places that de facto collaborate. Again, if you think about the European Union, where you have uh, mobility, whether within, in, within the Schengen area, or whether it's in the mutual recognition of their blue card system. So if one country offers a blue card, meaning a skilled professional five-year migration right to someone, then they are allowed to move in, around another European country, um, those kinds of things at a regional level. Um, I would like to see more of that in North America, which where it doesn't really quite happen yet. Right now, the US and Canada are directly competing you know, uh, for talent. Um, and in Asia, de facto, where at least in ASEAN, you have more um, free labor mobility within ASEAN, you could say that that's kind of happening. But that's not sort of intentional. It's just a byproduct of having the labor mobility accord among, among uh, ASEAN countries. Um, at, a, at a global scale, though, again, the answer is absolutely not. It literally will not happen. You must be very realistic about these things. Uh, at, at most, at a regional level, likely, at all likelihood, at best, at a sub-regional level, and just bilaterally. So the, the cooperation that I see is bilateral. It's when a country like Japan realizes that it has a massive shortage of nurses, it really signs a bilateral agreement with the Philippines and says, every year we want to have 50,000 or 100,000 uh, Filipino nurses uh, committed and trained in advance and brought to Japan to work in our uh, hospitals and hospices and elderly care homes and so on. And these pairs of countries that form Germany, for example, is doing something now with nurses from India, right, and starting to train them in India, one-way ticket, go to Germany and start to work in elderly care in Germany. You can see this in the construction sector. You can see it in farming. Uh, before COVID, Russia signed such a bilateral skills transfer partnership kind of MOU with India because they have a shortage of farmers. Even as Russia is becoming one of the world's largest food producers, there's not a whole lot of Russian farmers around. So bilaterally, wonderful examples of cooperation, uh, each in their own interest. Right? And I think that's extremely promising, actually. This was also interesting just in the past year in the UK, where, again, during COVID, there was this whole movement to, they had, they had you know, seasonal farmers that come in and out of the United States, United Kingdom, to pick apples and so forth. If you remember part of like Liz Truss's very short-lived political campaign was around, you know, everyone should eat these wonderful British apples, but they actually didn't have enough people to pick the apples. Um, so they, they started this whole movement and took out lots of ads in the media, like, you know, do your patriotic duty and go take a weekend off and go and pick apples in the British countryside. And guess how many young Britons showed up? Zero, right? 
So what I found out is that uh, kind of every week, a plane full of young men from Uzbekistan were actually being flown in to Britain to pick apples and, and other fruit. And then they would work for a month and pocket lots of cash and go back. And you just have, there got plenty of young men in Uzbekistan who will go and work for a month in British orchards um, and, and take care of it. So that was an example of a short-term skills transfer partnership. Um, we're going to see lots more of that. And I, I celebrate all of it, right? But does it add up? It adds up. Yes, maybe there's a whole greater than the sum of its parts somewhere. But is there, again, a top-down international legal framework for it? No, and there won't be. Thank you. And just as a follow-up to that then, which is maybe touches on your earlier point about winners and losers, um, it says the narrative around the winning states sets apart from the possibility to build a more collaborative and solidarity future. Very UWC statement. Competition is the central idea in the narrative presented. However, when there are winners, who are going to be the losers? And what is the responsibility of the winners for the consequences that the losers will face? Mm -hmm. Well, this is in some ways not a new question because this is the question that was, has been posed throughout the time in which we've looked at the brain drain effect, right? And there's, there's a, I, you could say unresolved, if you want, if you want to, a debate about whether or not brain drain is good or bad. On the one hand, again, um, you know, a lot of remittance value is, is, is sent back to countries, whether it was the Philippines, India, African countries. On the other hand, the talent is gone and often doesn't come back. And I think we're at an inflection point, as I said before, where some countries are permanently losing talent and won't really replenish that supply. Um, and, and India, again, is probably the only exception at this point, a country that just has so many people and so many young people that it can afford to give up people and still have plenty more, and has a very healthy global diaspora with a huge amount of capital circulation and knowledge circulation. That, that would be the ideal type relationship. So I don't, I don't choose a competitive frame for the sake of it, right? It's not my personal inclination. Um, but it's just a fact that in a world that is it, entering this demographic plateau, there is a finite number of human beings. And either you have those human beings in your economy, within your borders, as taxpayers, as workers, as homeowners and renters and entrepreneurs, or you don't have them. It is, it is precisely binary. They are either in your country or they are not in your country. And again, that's why instead of one or two countries having nomad visa programs, 100 do overnight because you realize, I need those people. I need them physically here. Otherwise, there is no one paying to you know, stay in a hotel. And that, that business gets crushed. It is, a, it is either you are inside one country or another country. So that is the competitive angle. Do I also believe that thanks to mobility and you know, the, 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 the privilege that young people have today to, to constantly circulate, that there is going to be something of a, um, a, a mutually beneficial circulation of people uh, in a circuit of countries that play by similar rules. Um, I call this the new Hanseatic League scenario. I won't go into too much detail on this, but suffice it to say, everyone should, should, say, should study this period of medieval history. But you know, sort of sets of countries that forge common uh, rules around migration and say that you know, if you are approved to live in this country, you can now also live in this country. You have automatic entry. And those countries may even have home sharing kinds of agreements. So these startup companies where it's like, oh, well, you're renting an apartment in our building in, um, you know, in, in uh, Edinburgh, let's say. Well, you are entitled to use one of our properties in Berlin. You know? And then their university campuses will form networks and so on. So there will be these networks of allied states or cities uh, again, sort of like the medieval Hanseatic League that will share common norms and codes and standards and circulate talent among them. And I think that's great. That's like collaborative. That's win-win. But right now, you're not talking about a lot of places that are, that are in that frame, in that mode. But the winning places will be, right? And that's why last night I was with I don't know, 500 Canadians uh, who are all here in town, university presidents, business people, representative of government, they're forging these partnerships all the way across the Pacific Ocean, saying, you know, we want to have this institutional partnership and this relationship with this government and make it as seamless and frictionless as possible for Asian talent to hop on a plane across the Pacific and be right at home in Canada. And come back if you want to, but then you can come back again, right? And that, that's the smart policy. And you just can't, I cannot guarantee it's a pipe dream to say that all countries are going to be enlightened and operate in that fashion. The smart ones will. 
but my hope is that they become uh, leading lights and, and role models. And that's why when people say that, that, that populism and protectionism and xenophobia are the norm, I say, well, that may be true in Hungary, but that's not true in Canada. That's not true in Germany. Right? That's not true in America, by the way. America is back up to nearly one million net international migrants ever since uh, the Biden administration came into uh, power. So the, the most desirable destinations in the world, uh, the countries that have been historical migration magnets, are back to those positive policies. Um, but they're doing so in a way in a competitive spirit, right? Because they realize that they want to win the young talent. Hi. hi. With regards to young talent, uh, so you're saying that the biggest population now are populated by Gen Zs, Alphas, and then they have the same values of mobility, connectivity, and sustainability. Does that mean that youth values are now the, the currency of choice, and will it be the e equalizer so that uh, a, a young person from Indonesia or India will have an equal chance of success as a young person from the US or Canada? That's, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And um, I guess the answer is tentatively that it's he heading in that direction. So for example, um, for reasons that are partially related to the war for young talent, uh, but also more driven by um, the, the growing clout of countries, whether it's Indonesia or Brazil or uh, Saudi Arabia or India, these countries' passports are generally gaining more mobility. So again, you can measure this. You know, a country whose passport used to allow you visa-free access to say 25 countries now gets you 75 countries, right? That's part of it. Then educational systems are improving and the certifications and standards are becoming more recognized and so those students are more likely to be able to travel abroad. The, the rising middle class in emerging markets means that developed country universities, whether it's US, Canada, UK, want to attract those cash rich, you know, tui full tuition paying students. That's certainly the case in America, Britain, and Canada. Uh, and in, in the United States, for the first time, Indian students, the new inbound Indian students outnumber new inbound Chinese students, uh, you know, in terms of new, new uh, arrivals on American uh, campuses. Um, and then there's the remote digital element of it, which is you know, companies saying, I'm just going to hire the best person. Doesn't matter where in the world they are, right? And maybe it's better to have someone who is living uh, at a lower, on a lower cost basis in a developing country as a remote worker than someone who costs, uh, uh, you know, uh, requires a huge salary and pension and all of these other kinds of things uh, right here in my home, own country. So I, I think there's a lot of trends uh, pushing in the direction of your point. Of your, it is coming true. It's not a future point. It's already happening. You can already see it uh, with the mobility, the growing mobility of young people from developing countries uh, around the world. And I think that's part of why, again, there's never been a better time to be young and skilled, no matter what your nationality. Whereas in the past, you would say, well, you've got to be young, skilled, and from a rich country, right? Uh, but that's not, not true anymore. So the, it, it, there really is a global opportunity. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, what are some of the factors that Singapore can attract more digital native to come and um, work and settle in Singapore, mm -hmm. given what we already yeah. have? Well, part of it is, is supply and demand, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the demand to live in Singapore exceeds the supply of, you know, annual, uh, you know, residency permits that they're going to grant. And, and, and this is, uh, again, something that's vacillated over, over the years. Uh, and during COVID, as the population actually numerically declined, right, for the first time in, in, in 60 plus years, the government said, well, okay, now it really, let's really hope borders open. And, and the borders did open and a lot of measures uh, behind the scenes were put in place and you have the result, which is the population is growing again um, very rapidly and we have, you know, housing shortages, you might even say, at least in the private market, or at least, you know, prices are, are rising to astronomical levels uh, for that reason. But is that the same as talent that plants roots? 
So part of what they want to do, you know, is to encourage people to establish companies. You know, if you want a visa of a certain kind, it may require that you employ locals, uh, that you, uh, you know, uh, acquire property, that you spend a certain amount of time here, those kinds of things. I think those are measures in that direction. In the academic market, it's tricky because you have to ensure that Singaporeans, first and foremost, uh, have uh, a place uh, in, in universities and in the, uh, in the polys and so forth before uh, making place for foreigners. And there are already quite a few foreigners. I do think, though, given the low fertility in Singapore, you really have to make sure that you have enough place always for a sufficient number, a growing number, of talented young foreigners, whether they are Asian or, or from anywhere in the world, in order to become part of the Singaporean system. Right? Not that they will necessarily become citizens and so forth, but to give them you know, student visas, to encourage them to stay here, and to you know, uh, make this their home, become permanent residents, work for Singaporean companies, serve the Singaporean economy. And that's going to be needed more than ever. Um, so I think that does require an expansion of the academic establishment. Again, it is happening for sure. Uh, this is a very small country, and it has, if you count universities and polytechnics, uh, you know, together, eight or nine, you know, major um, academic institutions. That's a really, really strong number. But there could be 10 or 12 if you wanted to uh, you know, really become a, a, a permanent standing global education hub with enough place for all the talent that you want to train in order to also have a stable, healthy, young, and growing population and to feed the needs of this very diversified economy that Singapore is uh, to have that pipeline of talent to serve its commercial interests. So I think that is definitely a pillar of what needs to be done. A second part that is obvious but has to be said is housing affordability, right, as I showed you before. Young people need to be able to afford a roof over their heads. This is a tough town to do that in, uh, to say the least. So, and that runs up against the space constraints, right, uh, as well. So that is a new-ish, new you might say, problem. But now it's a permanent one, because we see that people want to live in Singapore. Uh, you know, they want to establish a presence here. But, uh, but the supply constraints are, are, are dramatic. Uh, so I do think that's a big public policy priority. And, and the government has been thinking about, you know, how do you kind of quasi sort of offshore-ish? You know, how do you take advantage of, uh, of Johor and Bintan and you know, sort of areas that are a little bit cheaper and have more remote, uh, you know, digital uh, you know, offices, back offices, this kind of thing. All, all, things, all things are going to be tried, uh, you know, to cope with this. But at the same time, you know, you can't really imagine a population of like 10 million people, you know, suddenly, right? Um, you know, 6 million. Um, we're, not, we're not bursting at the seams, but you have to pre-design again, you know, to get up incrementally from 6 to 6.5 to, to 7, you know, and that, that's gonna, it's going to have to be done in a very, very slow and steady uh, fashion. Um, can I just, before we, we turn to that, just to ask a question which perhaps shifts the conversation a little bit, uh, specifically in, um, again, from one of our old friends of the college, who wants to know what scenarios you see for Russia. Oh, boy. Uh, Russia <laughs> was the question. Uh, well, Russia is, uh, um, uh, what is it, a riddle wrapped inside a puzzle, inside an enigma uh, that, that I've been grappling with, certainly for, for um, all of my career. And I've spent a lot of time there, and it's, uh, you know, structurally, it, you can't look at Russia through just one lens, just like you can't treat Russia like it's just European or just Asian, because it's both, right? Um, I describe Russia as geographically North Asian, um, because that's what most of Russia is. Russians don't think of themselves as North Asian, but geographers characterize it as North Asia. And given climate change and, and uh, the agricultural boom in the country and the uh, growing investment, uh, or at least up until, uh, well, even still, despite the Ukraine war and sanctions coming from China, um, you know, as you know, Asian countries have been more lenient, let's say, towards Russia in the past one year and not fully embraced it, but certainly kept all channels open, whereas the Western countries obviously have not. Um, so I do think there is an Asianization of Russia underway. If I had to point to the megatrends for Russia, one is the Asianization, the Asian tilt, if you will, which was underway really since the early 2010s. Um, then I would point, obviously, to climate change, right, and, uh, and the agricultural boom in the country, which they don't really yet have the capacity to fully harness. 
Um, so there's that. Um, it is a resource economy in a world that needs resources, right? And then there's the Arctic dimension in which Arctic trade and transshipment are becoming more central and Russia commands a very large share uh, of the Arctic. Uh, then there's also the demographic implosion of the country, obviously. And uh, in, just the, in just the last 15 years, there have been three major waves of outbound Russian um, uh, really exodus which is again separate from the post, from the end of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, 32 years ago, which was itself a major uh, exodus. But uh, now you're seeing Russians leaving en masse uh, to, to Kazakhstan, to the UAE, uh, to, to obviously to Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, probably never to return, right? They certainly didn't return in the last several waves. So, um, you know, again, there are these tipping points. There are these straws breaking the camel's back in terms of Russia's attractiveness to its own uh, people. Um, is there a scenario, though? Some of these things are linear. The climate thing is linear, right? Uh, the Asian investment in Russia's uh, infrastructure and agriculture and minerals, that's, that's linear. But politics is nonlinear, right? So you can imagine, you know, I, I, I say this in the book, Russia is not going to become a Eurasian Canada. Right? I mean, in terms of latitude, in terms of size, in terms of industrial composition, there are certain similarities between Canada and Russia, but when it comes to regime type, they're not particularly similar. The successor to Vladimir Putin is not going to look or feel or act like Justin Trudeau, right? Um, but you can nonetheless imagine a post-Putin Russia that does, simply by necessity, by demographic necessity, take a slight, have a slightly different view on immigration than the current government and society do. And that is something that I would hold the door uh, open to. And again, as someone who spent a lot of time in the country, outside of that nationalist, populist, um, fascist bubble, right, uh, of, of the Kremlin and the coterie around Putin, is a country of ordinary people, ordinary citizens, whose views I have not found necessarily to be any more extreme in any wonder, to be excessively culturally prejudiced on a scale that I have not seen in other countries. That's just not true of Russia. People say the same thing of Japan all the time. Japan is so insular, so xenophobic, they can't handle foreigners. Well, go to Japan. There have never been more foreigners living in Japan than right now today, right? There are about two and a half million foreigners living in Japan. And they're getting along just fine. Now, this is not a time when I encourage people to move to Russia. I don't see a lot of people. But like I said, um, it could be different. And I meet very pragmatic Russians. I meet, I've met lots of Russian academic administrators. You know, the number one thing they say, and it's actually so obvious, they say, we need to start teaching English. And we need to get more Asian students to come and study here. That's not the voice of the Kremlin speaking. That's just ordinary people saying, look at our economy, right? And uh, so I, I, I do actually think that, uh, that it's more likely than not that in, for its own survival, right, that Russia will have a different policy towards immigration in the future. Thanks. Um, you've talked about movement from country to country, but presumably in some of the bigger countries you've got the same migratory patterns, just not crossing borders. Right. So inside the US moving to California or... Um, are we heading towards a world that is um, a whole lot of mega zones with kind of intra-urban deserts and the odd oasis? Or do you see that there just reaches a critical size and then it spreads? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Well, urbanization, yes, right, irrevocably. And again, a lot of, this, this, a lot of people leapt to the conclusion during COVID that... Uh, you know, well, we all can, you know, just live in our uh, country home and, uh, and have Wi-Fi and work from wherever we want. That's not really true. You know, most jobs are, are still non-tradable services, meaning you have to physically be there. If you're a school teacher, you kind of need to go to school, right, and be there. Uh, if you work for a government, they make you go to the office, right? So um, not everyone has that luxury. And certainly in developing countries, the quality of life in cities is so much higher than in rural areas that people will gravitate towards the city, even if they had Starlink, you know, on their, on their mud huts, right? Um, so yes, urbanization is an inexorable trend. So we are continuously heading towards a world where 70, 80, 90, maybe eventually 100% of the world population is living in some urban conurbation 
of some size, right? Whether it's 50,000 people or 6 million people or 50 million people, whatever. So yes, universal urbanization, I think, is, is, is the trend. But I think you raise a very important point, which is that migration is not just international. And that's something that, that everyone has to remember. The definition of migration is the relocation of someone across geography. It's not that you have to cross a border. And the greatest migration in human history is just, again, Chinese people moving from the countryside towards uh, the urban coastal areas. The same thing is happening now in India with mass urbanization. Um, and within countries today, especially large countries, there's, uh, there's enormous migratory trends that are discernible. So Russians moving from east to west. Already it was mostly west, now it's almost entirely west. So one-seventh of Russia west of the Ural Mountains has 95% of the people, for example. Um, and uh, in the United States, actually, people moving from uh, the north and the east towards the south and the west has been a big trend over the past 100 years, uh, and which is kind of ironic given the climate uh, profile, right? This, the the, the cli climate, climate change is most negatively impacting the south and the west of the United States where the populations are growing and where you have a mega drought. So I imagine that the population of the United States will gradually, perhaps suddenly, start to shift back towards the north and the east again, which are much more climate propitious. Um, so will the, and as the world population again plateaus and even declines, right, will we effectively be, let's say, by the year 2050, right, will we be um, 9 billion people concentrated in cities in, you know, climate resilient northern hemispheric fortress zones? Yeah, that's a scenario. I think it's actually a very plausible scenario. Just to follow on from one part of what you said in there, um, with this concentration happening, you've got, I, mean, I guess Europe's made up of sovereign nation states, but they come together kind of geopolitically in some way. You've also got countries like India and the US that have already come together. They're one country that actually, they're, they're little um, pockets of at least economic, um, that, that can break off economically. Do you see that break off extending to a geopolitical break off where you start to see country, the, the bigger countries split out because you've got this concentration of economic power and they don't necessarily want to subsidise the rest of the, uh, yeah. that space or? It could happen. So this is known as devolution, right? So, so the, 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 the dissipation of political authority within a country on the basis of administrative kind of competition, de devolution of power. And that, that's, uh, that has occurred uh, already to a large degree. So India had 14 states at independence in 1947. Today it has 30, right? So you have that fragmentation. Um, and yes, you have, uh, you know, again, states in the United States, you know, wanting to, I mean, you know, there, there are states that pay in and states that, 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 that you know, sort of uh, are the, the recipients or benefactors from welfare, if you will, or recipients of welfare. Um, and so there are those calculations. You know, Italy is a good example of this. You know, uh, wealthier provinces like Tuscany and Venice pay in a lot more than they pay out, and they're trying to cut better deals. Again, devolution at work, saying that you know we want to reduce our uh, contribution to national coffers uh, because the federal government is basically just robbing us, right? And we don't know what's happening to the money, so they, they're demanding greater fiscal transparency and control. Uh, over national purse strings given their, their authority, their power uh, economically. So I think devolution is an extremely powerful trend pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, even interestingly, China. You know, we think of China as being a very vertically, you know, command and control kind of organized society uh, and economy. And to some degree, obviously, it is politically. But economically, commercially, there is a fair bit of devolution. You know, cities and provinces are encouraged to come up with their own business plans and economic models and attract investment and build their international partnerships and connections um, around the Belt and Road, for example, and so forth. So you, you do have a devolutionary trend everywhere. But will, there, will that lead to outright secessionism? You know, that, that's a different story. Um, you know, I think that uh, it could in some places and, and won't in others, basically. Uh, you know, it gets talked about more than it actually happens. Well then. We, could obviously, we could obviously talk for hours because there's so much to say. Um, most of us here today and probably um, watching have decided to move at one point or another. And we tend to think of these as our individual choices. So if you, Paragta, 
help us understand some of the big factors that are the aggregation of all our individual decisions is exactly the sort of thing that uh, we love to, to happen for us and for our students to lift us out of our daily routines and to see the big picture. So you've given me so much to think about. Um, uh, because the three things I'll mention just briefly that stuck out to me here. First of all, your phrase, uh, the future is youth in Asia. I thought you said youth in Asia no, no, at the start. Asian so, sorry, sorry, Asian <laughs> youth. Okay, you probably chose your words more carefully. Um, but very striking and sort of a reminder, I think, of the great responsibilities uh, and opportunities that are there for our students, who are, of course, uh, young people in Asia today. Um, I, I was also reminded, uh, we should talk about this sometime, but one of your phrases, uh, one, of your, one of your statements, you made me think about what William Gibson said, the future is here already, but it's not evenly distributed. Right. And just the sort of the way that the different parts of the world feel so different and are so differently attractive to, to young people today and how they need to be informed. Probably about uh, the internet speeds in various countries around the world. And thirdly, and the biggest thing for me to, that I'm taking away to think about is um, what you just alluded to briefly which is just none of us have ever been alive, and our parents have never been alive, and our grandparents have never been alive, except in a growing population, with all the opportunities and, and things that, that that brings with it. And actually, I think you, you didn't really allude to it, and I'd love to get you back for a seventh or eighth talk, sure. I don't know, um, exactly. just about what it will mean for our, nas for our psyches when we realize that humanity is declining. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably a very big, powerful thing to think about. There's only three little things to think about for the future. Uh, but Parag, thank you so much. Thank We're so grateful to you. Ladies thank and gentlemen, everyone. please, Parag Khanna. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just do a quick plug. Our next KMSS speaker series will involve Minister K. Shanmugan, Singapore Minister for Law, who will talk about the role of law in building an inclusive society. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Good night.